enjoying the grace of God the Son. Many of you may have heard of the disability campaigner Johnny Erickson Tarda. Over 40 years ago as a teenager, she suffered a terrible diving accident and she never walked again. And she recalls, I remember that long ago night when as a frightened 17 year old, I lay in a shadowy hospital room wondering if God had abandoned me. The hallways were dark and visiting hours were over, but then Jackie, my best friend, crept in beside me and she instinctively knew the only thing that would bring comfort. In the midst of that dark night, she sang, Man of sorrows, what a name, for the Son of God who came, ruined sinners to reclaim, hallelujah, what a saviour. Over the past decades, Johnny writes, whenever anyone asked me, when was the turning point? I described that moment. God can give no greater answer or reason or gift than himself. That's what Jackie helped me to grasp that night. God didn't give words. He gave the word. Jesus Christ, the bruised and bloody man of sorrows. That's the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Son of God, eternally perfect, eternally loved by his Father, was willing to become a man to share our set pain, to suffer with us and for us, and ultimately to bear the punishment our sin against God deserved. Now we saw in the first talk that we often close our services with a benediction, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And we're going to think just now about how we can grow in appreciation of the grace of Christ. Firstly, we'll look at how we grow in appreciation of the grace of the person and work of Christ, who he is and what he does. And then secondly, how we're to remain in or abide in, grow in our enjoyment of that union with Christ. So the grace of the person and work of Christ. For all eternity, there was love between the three persons of the Trinity. But between the three persons of the Trinity, there was never any need for grace because God is perfect. Grace is needed where there has been hurt and offence, rejection and sin. And of course we know that the triune God created our first parents perfect, but they broke God's law. And ever since that decision to sin in the Garden of Eden, we've all been born with sinful hearts. We don't want God telling us what to do. We'd naturally think far more about our own happiness than about the huge needs of those around us, and that is sin. And the triune God is both just and holy. He has to punish sin. But the fall into sin and the subsequent horrible effects of that in the world around us is precisely the theatre, the arena in which God's characteristic of grace is beautifully displayed. I live now in London and in the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, you can go into a dark room where there's a cabinet and there's a beautiful array of different diamonds displayed on a background of dark velvet. Now, you need that dark background to display the beauty of those jewels. And God's grace is displayed beautifully against the background of our sin. And Jesus Christ is the mediator. God became man who came willingly to take our sins upon himself, which was supremely a work of grace. 700 years before the birth of Christ, the prophet Isaiah spoke of a servant willing to suffer in the place of his people. You might like to turn to Isaiah chapter 53. And Isaiah chapter 53 verses 3 to 6 reads, He was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows familiar with suffering. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we have been healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's grace. We have turned to our own way, but the Lord has laid on him, Christ, the iniquity of us all. Thinking of Christ's person, we're to grow in love for Christ as both God and man, God all-powerful to save, 
man completely able to understand our weakness and suffering. And that's why the writer to the Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. We have one who has been tempted in every way as we, yet was without sin. So we have a personal love for Christ as our great high priest. He's offered himself as the final sacrifice to sin, and he now intercedes with the Father for us. Because of our guilt, we need a priest. Every day we can know peace and forgiveness because Christ, our priest, has made that sacrifice for us. But we can also have a personal love for Jesus Christ as our prophet. He teaches us the will of God. He sends his Holy Spirit to teach us all things. So we often feel ignorant. We feel we don't know what to re say in certain situations. We don't know how to react to certain situations. We feel we don't relate well to others. We lack wisdom. We want to know more about God. And it's Christ who is our prophet who teaches us the will of God by his word and by his spirit. So he's our priest, he's our prophet. And then we can have a personal love for Jesus Christ as our king. He's seated at the Father's right hand, extending his kingdom until all his enemies are defeated. But he's also our king. He's ruling over us, protecting us and defending us. We're weak and helpless. We may feel there's nobody there for us, nobody else who can help us or defend us, but Jesus Christ, our King, is mighty to protect. And then we can grow in personal love for the Lord Jesus Christ as our brother. We're brought into his family by adoption. We're fellow heirs with him. And because of our union with him, we know God as our father. And even more than that, we grow in love for our Lord Jesus Christ as our friend, even as our husband. Human marriage is ultimately just a signpost, a pointer to the greater, deeper, richer love of Jesus Christ for his bride, the church. And that's why so many through history have seen the Song of Solomon as a beautiful song pointing to the love relationship between Christ and the church. And the wonderful portrayals of the lover are seen as pointers to the glorious person of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we see the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ in his person, as God and man, as our prophet, our priest, our king, as our brother, our husband, our friend, but we also see his grace in his work. He has loved his people with an everlasting love, and it was that love that meant that he came to earth to accomplish the work of salvation. The work of Christ involves his perfect life. We've disobeyed all the laws of God, but Christ kept all of those laws perfectly on our behalf. The work of Christ includes his perfect death, dying as a substitute in our place, suffering the punishment that we deserve. It includes his resurrection and ascension, which demonstrated his deity, his defeat of death, and it guarantees our resurrection from the dead as well. His work involves his ascension and his reign. Jesus Christ now rules at the Father's right hand and is interceding for us. So his grace is shown in his person and his work, but how do we increase in our enjoyment of that? Well, we're to abide in Christ. We're to enjoy our union with Christ. And here we turn to John chapter 15. We're going to read John chapter 15 verses 1 to 11. And as we do that, be looking out for the number of times the word remain in, or it may be abide in your version, comes up. John chapter 15, verse 1. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself, it must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourself to be my disciples. 
As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Jesus here teaches his disciples that they are joined to him, just as the branches of a vine are joined to the vine itself. And of themselves, they can't produce spiritual life. But if they're taking energy and strength from the vine, from Christ, they can. So the New Testament teaches both that believers are in Christ and that Christ is in them. And that union with Christ is a reality. It's achieved and given as a gift because of Christ's saving work at Calvary. We're joined to the head, that is Christ, and we're joined to his body, which is the church. You can't be joined to the head without the body. We need to be part of a church family. And the ordinance of baptism symbolizes union with Christ in his death, burial and resurrection and the washing away of sins by his perfect work. And the special means of grace that God has appointed where we remember and appreciate the fact that we're in Christ is the Lord's Supper or the communion service, which is a wonderful opportunity for us to have fellowship with our Lord and remember the price he paid for our salvation. So abiding in Christ is corporate as well as personal. But of course we are to enjoy that experience of abiding in Christ as a personal experience. In our first talk, I mentioned the great revival preacher, Jonathan Edwards and his wife, Sarah. Now Sarah, as we said, lived through an extraordinary spiritual awakening where she experienced an increased awareness of the love of God for her, but she also increased a a deep awareness of love for Christ and his love for her. And so she wrote in her diary of, of one night where she wrote, that night was the sweetest night I ever had in my life. I never before for so long a time enjoyed so much of the light and rest and sweetness of heaven in my soul. All night long, I continued in a constant, clear and lively sense of the heavenly sweetness of Christ's love, of his nearness to me and my dearness to him. This lively sense of the beauty and excellence of divine things continued right through till the morning. Now, this was not just an emotional passing experience. As I said during the first talk, Over the next several years, Sarah suffered a whole series of devastating hardships, but she remained through those years absolutely convinced of the grace of Christ. She knew that Christ had demonstrated grace upon grace in giving up his own life. He demonstrated that grace because he loves us and he invites us to respond to that grace. I want to now highlight two ways in which we can abide in Christ and enjoy our union with him. First of all, to enjoy the grace of Christ, we need to spend time with him each day. So I simply ask the question, do you spend time with the Lord every day? Read his word, pray to him. That will lead to an increase of enjoyment of his love. Secondly, if we're to enjoy the grace of Christ, we are not just to keep that grace to ourselves, we are to share that grace with others. In John chapter 15, verse five, Jesus says, if we're abiding in him, we will bear fruit. We will be serving others, witnessing to others, passing his life to others. Imagine at the feeding of the 5,000, if Jesus passed the bread to the disciples and they just put it into their bags and just kept saying, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord, praise you, Lord, you're so good to us, Lord but they completely failed to hand out the bread to the hungry crowds. It's absurd. And yet how often do we praise Christ for his grace to us and forget, ignore the fact that at least a third of the world has still not heard about that grace or we sing of his grace and don't think about the fact that our own neighbors may never heard of that grace. If we understand the grace of Christ, we understand that that free offer of grace is open to all and we want to share it. I've mentioned Francis Ridley Havergal's hymn, Take My Life and Let It Be Consecrated Lord to Thee. And I think there's a beautiful reminder in a little booklet that she wrote explaining that hymn called Kept for the Master's Use. And in that booklet, she explains that we are to consecrate our lives to Christ. We're to abide in his love, we're to share his love with others, 
because we know the extent to which he has shown love for us. So I'm going to close this talk with just a little quotation from that booklet kept for the master's use. The Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. Yes, himself. What is the bride's true and central treasure? What calls forth the deepest, brightest, sweetest thrill of love and praise? Not the bridegroom's priceless gifts, not the robe of his glorious righteousness, not the gift of unsearchable riches, not the magnificence of the palace home to which he is bringing her, not the glory which she will share with him, but himself. Jesus Christ, who in his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree, the same Jesus whom, having not seen ye love, the Son of God, the Man of Sorrows, my Saviour, my Friend, my Master, my King, my Priest, my Lord and my God. He is not only all, but ever for you. Just one glimpse of the glory of his love and henceforth by grace, this will be our true-hearted, whole-hearted cry. Take myself and I will be ever only all for thee.